Well, welcome to the second one in the Nobel series. Um, I think, as I mentioned last week, I think this is a vintage year for the Nobel Prizes. And this is the particular prize uh, that deserves that. Uh, why? Not so much because of what it's accomplished so far, but because of its potential. Uh, mostly for good, but, uh, but uh, as we'll see at the end of the talk, uh, potential risks with it, but uh, gene editing. And unlike uh, the, the physics talk uh, uh, and, and the chemistry one, or at least the, the medicine one that's coming up, uh, where the work happened, you know, a decade or two, or even in the case of uh, the physics one uh, back in the 1960s. This is stuff that just started to happen about a decade ago. It's not to say that people hadn't tried gene editing, but up until this time, with the advent of CRISPR, it was a clunky affair and it wasn't very precise and it was costly. Uh, so it wasn't very practical. So the revolution here is the ability, the capacity to change the genome with precision and do it cheaply. Um, uh, so that's what it's really all about. It, it wouldn't be a talk from me if you weren't looking at some ancient uh, ancestor. And you've actually seen these before, but now I've kind of put them in order because Here's uh, Lucy or Lucy's species, Afrensis. So this is 3.66 million years ago. And those are the tracks. And if you look at them, you can see the adult and you can see the adolescent or the child uh, beside. And sometimes the child kind of weaves in and out. Um, uh, but it's a pretty natural walk. And this is from um, a bipedal ape with a brain size of, um, at the most of a chimpanzee's brain. So uh, probably not much in the way of cognitive attainment. But anyway, so there it is. And what happened here? Uh, stuck again. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we are. So here's the one, you saw this one, Saudi Arabia, this is a modern human. And uh, of course, Saudi Arabia, when it was lush and with lakes, the, this is a footprint in a lake bed. So 120,000 years ago, and a lot of inferences uh, to suggest, strongly suggest that this was made by a modern human. That doesn't mean behaviorally modern human, but certainly anatomically modern human. And, um, but uh, it could have been made by a Neanderthal, and certainly Neanderthals were around that area at that time. And then this one, which kind of rolls it forward, I think this one, I showed you this last week in New Mexico, is it intrig these intriguing prints that go on for about uh, um, a mile one way and then the return trip. And, um, and it's a mother, a young mother uh, carrying um, uh, a small child on her left hip for periods of time. And then maybe the kid was wiggling or whatever and she would put the kid down and then you see the footprints and you can see the footprints actually in the lower part of that picture of the child. And then the, she'd pick up the child again and go on for another there. But, um, so the last two would be modern humans and the first one would be uh, one of the members of the Australopithecus before that. But, so we're just moving on. Here we are at the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for gene editing. And Emmanuel Carpentier uh, uh, and Jennifer Duden, and notice that DNA at the end, Duden, Duna, and uh, so um, she certainly had the right name. And um, so these, be, these people became, these two became colleagues about uh, six or seven years ago um, at, at meetings where they met and um, uh, Carpentier's time was mostly in, in Europe and Duna's in California in the United States. So, uh, but they became very good friends. Then there were others involved in this. It's, it's always difficult to choose who should get an award. I love this one because it, 
connects uh, the physics series with this series because there she is, Emmanuel, and uh, she, she's next to the bust of Max Planck. Um, so one of the physicists that we covered, I think, in the second or third session of that series. So there they are together. And, uh, um, and by the way, she spent a fair bit of time at, uh, at the Max Planck Institute. And there they are. I, 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 they should choose a, a different artist to do these pictures or portraits of these people that look far better. Now, here's the, I've used this book by Jennifer uh, Dudna, um, and it's about four years old, three or four years old, but uh, uh, you can see where she's heading, a crack in creation, gene editing, the unthinkable power to control evolution. Boy, there are about four or five power words in that sentence, in the title. So you know where she's going, right on the cover. Uh, but uh, listen, gene editing isn't the only revolution, biological re revolution. Uh, one of the two other books, uh, one on epigenetics, and that's the whole field that's really only about, uh, also about 10, maybe as much as 15 years old, but mostly 10, meaning uh, changes in, in, uh, in traits that have nothing to do with the change in the, in the DNA, uh, but the selection of which genes are active and which not. And uh, of course, that's very obvious in the book on your right, How to Grow a Human uh, by Philip Ball, because, because it's perfectly, or it's become very uh, obvious in the last, uh, say, well, since the last 20 years, that you can, for example, scrape some skin cells off an adult uh, human and, um, and stimulate them, and they'll revert to stem cells, and then you can turn them about and redirect them to become brain cells or whatever else. So there's a lot of flexibility built into the, this biological system that no one had any hint of. Now, of course, if you, I've said this before, if you think about normal human development, of course there's a lot of change here because you start out with a single fertilized egg, one cell, and in no time at all, they're up in the hundreds and the thousands and the millions, and they're destined to, be, uh, to become one of uh, several thousand very specific cells in the body, and, that's, and all of them have exactly the same DNA. So it's really just a matter uh, if, if this were an orchestra, uh, then just choosing which instrument or whatever, like the director, which ones to come on stream and which to uh, be quiet. That's what's really happening. And, and that's what's happening with the epigenetics revolution. So just to point out here that this is not just about gene editing. The whole field of biology is moving ahead in leaps and bounds these days. And uh, so we're talking about one thing here. I'm sure we're going to hear more from a Nobel group about these other areas um, as we move along. So listen, I, I really can't talk about gene editing without a little review about, uh, about chromosomes and, uh, and genes. So you just kind of get a feel for it. So here is one chromosome. We have uh, 46, 23 pairs. Here's one pro pro chromosome, and it has two strands of DNA, one of them from the father, one from the mother. That little dot in the, the middle, that red dot, is where they're connected, the so-called central pair. So just moving along in this review, I kind of like this slide because it, it's like pulling a string. Of, uh, my wife used to have balls of wool, and you pull out one string, and it all kind of unravels as you pull it out. And here it is unraveling, pulling out one of those arms from the chromosome, whether it's the father or the mother's side. And, uh, and here's that um, double helix. And then at the very bottom, it's been opened up. The strands have been pulled apart. So the bases are no longer attached. But you know, there are only four bases. All of the genetic information is coded with four bases and the order in which those bases appear. And not only that, it's even more restrictive than that. 
they call it causal. They're, they're fixed pairs of phases. So thymine always connects with adenine, cytosine with guanine, okay? But it's in that series in which they, they, they show up in the, in the strip. And, uh, and along that strip, uh, there's a little code that says the gene starts now. And there's another little signal at the end to say the gene has stopped here. So that makes sense. Well, um, uh, I don't, I, I, the only reason why I'm showing you this, because the previous slide shows this stuff, except if, if you think about uh, DNA as a ladder, then all of the genetic, the important genetic information is in the rung. Those two bases coming together, forming a rung and a series of these rungs. And then, but, uh, but, but you're not gonna climb a ladder without sides here. And the sides are made up of uh, phosphate uh, groups and sugar groups. It's the same. So that's the ladder. Now, I want to, here's a really quick summary of genes. About 25,000 of our genes code for certain proteins. That's what they do. But there are a whole lot of other, if it were left to that, uh, we wouldn't be who we are. Uh, there are a whole lot of other genes that play a role like the conductor and an orchestra in selecting which of those protein and coding genes are active. Um, and the other way of thinking about it is, um, is that all genes have an address. So I'm 180 Gage Street. Uh, you all have individual uh, addresses, but you also have neighborhoods. And so genes for, uh, that are closely related live or occupy the same area, the same genetic neighborhood, okay? And then of course you have uh, townships and cities and countries. The, the, the world would be the whole genome. Now, one of the things uh, that's really important to realize is that traits such as cognitive traits uh, aren't, uh, they really require uh, the activity of, of several hundred, even thousands of genes to shape height, uh, perhaps intelligence, uh, memory, mathematical talents, all those kinds of things. So, Gene editing, as it stands now, is no threat to that kind of thing. Gene editing would have to be a lot better than it is now if we were going to enhance intelligence, if we could understand what intelligence was. Um, the other thing, a gene can have different functions depending on the company it keeps. Now that's important because uh, when you edit a gene, uh, you better have a, a pretty good idea of what that gene does and, and some of these uh, other effects of that gene, that if you edit the, the gene might be adversely affected. And of course, it goes without saying that, that many genes have very ancient heritages. I mean, going right back to four billion years. The whole replication, translation, transcription business of, of, of changing um, RNA, then DNA into proteins, um, all of those mechanisms were laid down really early, as were all the genes that are related to energy metabolism. And they've been retained, as well as those genes that kind of dictate what the envelope or the cell membrane is like. So, and, and, and also the layout, uh, you know, it's a very common format, isn't it? Head forward, eyes forward, uh, smell forward, four limbs, tail at the back, and, um, and, and, um, and uh, urine, uh, elimination at the back too. So that's a common format. And so some genes are packaged to provide that kind of format all kind of working together, right? 
Uh, the other thing is that, uh, is that uh, it, you probably know this as well, but humans born outside of Africa, at least in Europe and, um, and where those Europeans went, carry at least one or two percent of our genome. I don't know what mine is, is, uh, is Neanderthal. And if you're in Southeast Asia or Australia, then uh, maybe as much as two to four percent of your DNA comes from uh, denosophans, which are kind of the um, Neanderthal equivalent uh, in the Eastern, uh, in East Asia. Uh, we're not going to talk about the founder effect and genetic drift, but now here's something that's very important. And I put Dudna's, I mean, this is a quote from Dudna. And I've used some of the illustrations from her material because uh, I might say that book that she wrote that I, I mentioned earlier, it's really well written. You don't, you don't have to know a lot about genetics to understand that book. And yet it's come from somebody who just won the Nobel Prize. That's pretty unusual. Uh, so, but the point that she makes here is that you know, some people get uppity about uh, gene editing because they think of the genome as, uh, as, uh, as territory to be preserved as if it were static. Well, it is anything but static. It's certainly true um, that any lining, intestinal lining, the lining of the urinary tract, and the outer lining, our skin, are constantly changing all the time. I mean, uh, every cell in the skin is probably uh, turned over within a matter of weeks. And that's probably the same for the intestine. Now, if when that happens, there's the potential for mistakes, isn't there? Because every time a cell replicates, there's the possibility of a mutation. And if there's the possibility of a mutation, there's the possibility that might be an adverse mutation. And that probably accounts for many bowel cancers, many skin cancers, especially if you combine that with ultraviolet radiation. Um, so, and the bone marrow uh, for the frequency of leukemias, uh, because these are areas where cells are constantly being made and therefore the risk of mistakes. Now, I don't know where they come up with this, but uh, but she said, uh, one million mutations takes place throughout the body per second. Well, in the time I've been talking, there must be millions and millions of mutations that have taken place uh, somewhere. So we don't need to, I, I don't know who dreams stuff up like that. Now, it's carrying on with mutations. Um, one uh, way of thinking about it, uh, we all think of the Bible as a as a fairly, not the biggest book, but a big book. Uh, and it has a lot of pages in it, several hundred pages. And um, if you think of the genome and every letter in the Bible, not word, every letter in the Bible as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a base pair, then, um, then you'd have to copy that Bible 20 times to get something equivalent to copying all of your DNA. So, uh, and every time it replicates itself, there's the possibility for errors. Now, what you may not know is that, um, yes, there's a lot of uh, DNA in our nucleus, that's where most of it is, but we have uh, uh, hundreds of little enclosed, um, uh, membrane enclosed uh, uh, structures inside our cell that provide us with the energy to keep the cell going. These are called mitochondria. Um, they uh, probably, uh, oh, two billion years ago, uh, kind of a, those mitochondria were separate cells. And they've linked up with uh, bacteria or archaic uh, cells and to form a kind of combination. And in the process, those, uh, uh, at least one of, one of those partners, the mitochondria, what became mitochondria, shed a lot of their genes. 
uh, but what they retain are the genes that are important for energy. Now, what kinds of mistakes? Well, first of all, mutations are common. Uh, most of those are neutral, meaning nothing happens. Um, but occasionally they're lethal. That probably accounts for some miscarriages for women. Something lethal happens in the fetus quite early and, um, and, uh, and the fetus is rejected for good reason. And occasionally mutations are beneficial. Um, sometimes the mistakes involve a single base, uh, an insertion of a base, a deletion of a base, or the addition of one or more bases. Um, and sometimes, um, one of the most common disorders I used to look after in, in um, a neuromuscular clinic was a disorder called myotonic dystrophy. And, and, and the genetic error there are these run-on triplets. It's like A, B, C, 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 and on for 100 or so. So you can imagine how distorting such a, such a chunk of DNA would be to the rest of the, um, of the nearby genes. So, um, and in fact, the longer that error, the more severe the disease is, is expressed clinically. So, now, um, in the, in the uh, 1980s, uh, you know, people were trying to figure out, well, when did modern humans emerge? And one of the ways to figure that out, and one of the ways, the original way that it was done, was to look at mitochondrial DNA. There are only 37 genes, so it's pretty simple. And what you do is you compare the, the genome of the mitochondria of, of living people and, and look at the, the differences between populations. And then if you look at the, if you can assume at a certain standard rate at which uh, genes will mutate or change, you can figure out the genetic distance backwards at which the common ancestor emerged, and it was called mitochondrial E. Okay? That doesn't mean that there was one woman. It means that there were probably several hundred at that time. So anyway, and what was that? It was around 150,000 years ago. And it says nothing about how um, uh, behaviorally modern they were, uh, except to say that anatomically modern humans have been around since uh, maybe, and that's based on fossil evidence, for at least 200,000 years. Uh, but again, we don't know about their behavior. Now, we've talked about uh, some of this, the revolutions in genetics, uh, the ones you know about, working out the structure of DNA, well, that's Watson and Crick in 1953. And then in the next decade or so, or two, two or three decades, they figured out how DNA made copies of itself. And then they figured out how the DNA and RNA make proteins. And then the methods for, uh, for working out the sequences of these bases became cheaper and technically easier so they could map the genome and therefore compare species to see how related or unrelated they are. Um, for example, the cichlid fish in Lake Victoria in Africa, they have a common ancestor that goes back maybe 500 years, maybe a little bit more. But there are several hundred of them now in, in living in different niches, different colors, different sizes, different jaw sizes. And by the way, um, most of those differences are related to epigenetic changes, not so much changes in the DNA sequence. So on we go. Now I've chose, chosen a couple of figures from uh, Jennifer Dudna's book, and I like this one because this is CRISPR. So it's an acronym. And right at the bottom, you can see there, what's it stand for? Clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeat. Don't write it down because it'll be there. So uh, look at that cell. Now that's a simple cell. There is no nucleus there. The DNA just kind of occupies 
the center, of the, you can see the, the strand you know, coiling around itself. But the CRISPR part, look at that. It, you see those diamonds? That's the palindromic part of it, meaning the base sequence reads the same uh, from the start to the finish as from the finish back to the start. So that's palindromic. All right. When bacteriologists had observed this, when, when they looked at the DNA of, of uh, certain bacteria, they were really curious about this because, and they focused most of their attention on the spacers, the palindromic thing. And I thought, gee, isn't that crazy? We have these identical segments at intervals. So that doesn't make any sense. Well, then somebody said, well, maybe it's not the spacers. Maybe it's the stuff in between the spacers. And then because they knew what the sequences were of those pieces between the palindromic uh, uh, pieces there, the, the triangles, um, well, guess what? They matched uh, different viral uh, uh, DNA or even RNA pieces. So uh, clearly, this, these bacteria were keeping a library, a genetic library, of, of uh, previous contacts with different viruses. That's what it's all about. This is a library. Now, why the library? Because that's the first line of defense. If a, if a virus attacks a cell like this, what, what the cell does is it looks for a match between its library and the invader. And if it recognizes it as, hey, I recognize that guy or gal, uh, I know what to do with that one. Um, and uh, and it, so there are certain proteins that are attached to this CRISPR sequence. These are the Cas enzymes. These are the, the enzymes that can kind of chew up uh, DNA. So that's CRISPR Cas. You've just got it right now. That's what they found uh, about these bacteria. Now, when the bacteriologists were were really interested in this because it, it, it was kind of a neat um, immune system uh, that they didn't, with a complexity, they didn't expect to find in bacteria, but, but most of them didn't kind of get it. But some said, gee, well, if um, here's a mechanism, there's a mechanism here for identifying specific sites on a genome. I wonder if that's a way of, if I have a way of identifying a target and I want to change it or edit it, this is the clue to how to do it. So let's just move on a little bit. So here's figure uh, two from Dudner's book. And this actually shows it. So at the bottom, you have a virus at uh, the, the cell membrane at the bottom and that ugly looking uh, virus down there. And it's injected its, its DNA into the cell. But what does the cell do? It compares, it, it looks for similarities uh, in, the, in the genome of the virus and those segments, those memory segments. And what it does is it makes an RNA copy of the part that matches the virus. And then it couples it with these CAS, CAS proteins. And the two together then latch on to that viral DNA. And then the, and the enzymes destroy the virus. That is, if I said nothing else and you walked away now, you've got it. That's, that's it. Now, um, is it more complex than that? Yes, it is, uh, because the field has kind of moved on. But that's really it. Now, I put this one up. I know it's cluttered, but it's a bit of the history. You, uh, you may or may not have read that article I had in the, in the paper. But um, 
I've, you know, I've been interested in this stuff since about 2015, 14, 15. So I knew, I was very aware of these two groups. And, uh, and I knew it was really hot stuff, or I thought it was really hot stuff. And I thought, geez, uh, one of these groups is going to get a Nobel Prize, or maybe a combination of the two. And then year after year, I'd write a little some, something in the paper and say, gee, it should happen this year, and then it didn't. Well, you know why it didn't? because they were busy suing one another. And why is that? Because there's a lot of money in, in editing plants and uh, 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 in, in making some of them more resistant to different uh, organisms um, and on the medical side. Um, so, um, and and if you look just on your left on that one, you can see that the, the earliest people were Doudna and company, okay? They were the ones that showed how CRISPR, the previous slide I showed you, could be used at previous slides. That's Doudna stuff. That's what it is. Um, the group in Boston from the Broad Institute, uh, they're a pretty sh sharp group. They were, they were quick to see the significance of this. And, uh, and both groups applied for patents. But the difference was that the Boston group fast-tracked the patent. So even though they applied for the patent after the group in California, theirs was approved first. Now, it's always a messy game because when uh, a similar challenge was made in the, um, in, um, European market, uh, uh, Dudna won. I thought it was really interesting that they held off here and really interesting who they labeled, but also I haven't seen a Nobel Prize yet uh, where uh, they openly talked about or uh, this competition, the commercial side of it. I thought that was really interesting about this Nobel Prize. Um, and then you can see other people. Uh, here we are, what, 2013, 14, 15 in there. You know, this, I'll tell you, the thing is CRISPR, this technique is cheap. It doesn't require a big lab. Uh, I mean, this could be done on the street almost. Well, not quite, but almost. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I've told some of you that uh, I mean, in the last two or three years, every time I get nature or science, uh, at least for, for a couple of years, there was often stuck on the cover uh, with that kind of sticky goo, uh, an advertisement uh, for a guide. So if I wanted to use CRISPR and I knew what the target was, meaning the sequence of bases, and I could spell that out for say 20 or 30 bases, I could send it off to this company and I would get a package back in probably a week or two uh, overnight back. Providing, I, I, I wouldn't have to make the guide. And uh, so that could be delivered to me. So, um, so you get, uh, uh, so this is kind of a, a technology that has escaped the big, uh, the big centers or possibly has. Uh, because it's cheap, it's ex and it's accessible, and um, and it's almost unmanageable from the point of view of regulation, because no one agrees on what's ethical or not, and um, and some countries have gone ahead with gene editing in monkeys and in human embryos, and it, I mean that that was just going to happen. And it wasn't as if in, in that in the latter cases that um, that uh, that Americans and and uh, and people in the UK uh, were unaware of this stuff, and they weren't raising their hand and say, "Oh, don't stop." The stop sign went out went up after it was done, but they knew about the work. After all, a lot of these. People in, uh, in China, shall, shall we say, I'm using that as an example, had trained in the United States. 
So they, 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 do, they knew one another. Um, and um, so moving along, so uh, I don't know whether I need to do that. I don't need to do this. I've already talked about this. Now, gene drive, this is another thing because uh, maybe we'll talk about this, but vector-borne diseases like malaria, uh, as soon as uh, gene editing, CRISPR came along, um, there were people who said, gee, we've got, uh, we've got a great tool here uh, for uh, neutering mosquito males. And if we neuter the mosquito males, that should reduce the risk of malaria. But along came another technique from Cambridge University in the UK called gene drive. What is gene drive? Well, we have two copies of each gene. And normally when they kind of come together or sorted out, they're kind of uh, equally balanced with the possibility of which one's gonna come out first. But with gene drive, you favor one outcome. It's as if what one is going to happen 90% of the time and the other one 10% of the time. So you see what happens on the, on the right here. Within two or three generations, you wiped out the mosquito population. And you can't get them back if that's what you do. It's one of those errors. Uh, it, so this has made people wary about gene editing. It's really precise and coupled with gene drive, it has the capacity to wipe out whole species with no chance of getting them back. And you might say, well, uh, gee, after swatting yourself in the summer and all that kind of stuff and the kinds of things that happen with mosquitoes, they, well, that's all a good thing. But the truth is, is it? Do we actually know that? Well, we don't know what the consequences are. And so that's why the reservation. Now, uh, examples. What are the, th I'm, a, I'm a neurologist, so I'm a little biased in the disorders I look at, but one of the, one of the worst diseases uh, I've seen in my career is Huntington's disease. And uh, it's a genetically transmitted disease and um, it's uh, autosomal dominantly transmitted, meaning only one parent has to have it. And, uh, and um, you only need one copy to get it. And so, and, and it's, and if you carry that gene, you are going to get it 100%, you are going to get it. And, and it's not a good disease to get. Uh, ultimately, it leads to dementia, but it creates uh, some movement, uh, movement disorder and some psychological problems. Anyway, it's, 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 uh, it's quite a disease. And, and families uh, often hide that they have members of the family have this. And the same happens with a familial form of Alzheimer's disease in Colombia, you know, where it's an autosomal dominantly transmitted disease. So it may, you know, when CRISPR came out, this is a single gene disorder. Fix the gene. I mean, what happens in Huntington's Korea? There's a mutant gene, which makes a mutant messenger RNA, which makes a mutant protein, and the cell fails. That's what happens, uh, spelled out simply. That's what happens. So if you can change that anywhere along the line, that would be great. Well, if you wanted to get rid of the risk of Huntington's disease for all generations to come, you would do it at the germ cell level, wouldn't you? You would try to fix the egg. So, so if you, for example, if you, um, if you had a family with Huntington's disease and one of them, at, uh, was it, uh, one of them wanted to get married and, and carried the gene and therefore there's this, this chance, 50% chance of a child developing Huntington's disease and then you have CRISPR, the technology. Well, then one of the things you might want to think about, or people thought about a few years ago, well, uh, here's the perfect thing. Um, why not harvest the eggs or some eggs, several eggs, and then uh, put them out in a kind of a Petri dish, 
and, uh, and map their genomes to figure out which ones are actually affected. Uh, and, and then find the one that isn't affected and then and, uh, use that egg, for example, with IVF. Uh, you could potentially do this with a sperm, by the way, as well. Um, or you could actually edit it. So if you had a, uh, an egg that had the abnormality, then you could use CRISPR to fix it. And it would be fixed for successive generations thereafter. Um, sounds lovely, doesn't it? But as it turns out, at this point in time, and that may be where we're headed, but this is where most of the controversy comes with, uh, with CRISPR. These uh, unseen, unknown risks that we don't know about until they actually happen down the line. And when you do something to a germ cell, you've done it for successive generations. Okay, so it's not something you do easily. Um, well, remember I showed you those books, uh, Epigenetics and the other one kind of making, um, making uh, different, um, uh, different cells, uh, 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 use stem cells. I mean, a great source of, uh, for editing are if you use any, any disease that affects the bone marrow. So uh, hemolytic anemia. Uh, would be one that we might talk about in just a minute. Uh, it, th that's, th those are very accessible cells. So you can uh, 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 take uh, um, sample of the, the, the bone marrow, select out the stem cells, uh, and then edit with CRISPR those stem cells and then before re-infusing the fixed stem cells, then you have to use chemotherapy to wipe out all the other cells in the, in the bone marrow. Um, and then after you've done that, that's the high risk part of it, and then re-infuse the fixed stem cells. So that's, uh, it sounds complicated, but, but it actually works. Um, so, um, and one of the ways of doing this is to use a, a virus as a, as a vector. And now these are, are these, one of the things that holds up a lot of this work, at least in, in humans, is it's, uh, there are only a few sources that make uh, viruses that are known to be safe. And so you want uh, viruses that uh, have, a, prope have a, uh, a propensity for uh, invading cells and also uh, kind of locking onto the cell's DNA. So uh, they're often adenoviruses. So in the top, uh, in the left here, you see that kind of little red part. And, and on the shoulder side, you have the viral DNA and, and CRISPR has been used to insert uh, a new gene. And then um, use it, uh, and then that CRISPR edited uh, DNA has been injected into the virus. The virus gets into the cell, and then the and then the, that edited part of the DNA spills out into the interior of the cell, and you have the correction. So you've used a, uh, a virus as a vector. It's a good way of reaching. So viral vectors. Um, well, I'll just actually describe this. Adrenal leukodystrophy is a rare disease. Uh, I've only seen a few in my career, but they've been nasty uh, because it interrupts with the insulation or uh, around nerve, nerve fibers. And so communication between nerve cells is interrupted and sometimes the nerve cells destroyed. So it's a, it's a nasty uh, disease. So uh, in this particular one, um, what I've just outlined as, as uh, as the procedure would be to harvest bone marrow cells. And then uh, you insert the corrected gene uh, into a virus um, and using CRISPR to inject that, that new 
gene into the virus. And then, um, and so now you have bone marrow cells that are carrying the right gene, then chemotherapy to wipe out the existing bone marrow stem cells, and then reinfuse the edited bone marrow uh, cells. Uh, it works. The problem is here um, is getting to patients early enough because with most diseases, if they've advanced too far, no matter how high tech the, the treatment, it's, uh, it may be too late. And that's probably one of the issues uh, with, um, with Huntington's disease and, and, and even with the um, familial form of Alzheimer's disease. So we won't, now, um, the ones that I've had some personal connection with are Duchenne muscular dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is, a, is an awful one because the mutant gene, it's one of the biggest genes in the human genome. It's a huge gene, but it codes for uh, proteins that provide stability for this cell membrane. So people who have a mutant form of that, the membranes keep breaking in muscle fibers of the heart and the skeletal muscles in the limb. And, uh, and most cases are dead by their early 20s. So it, it, it's a, again, it's a single gene disorder. And it's a, it's a candidate like myotonic dystrophy and Huntington's disease for CRISPR. Um, one of the, one of the really interesting ones for me is this progressive muscular atrophy because um, I, I, did, I never practiced pediatric neurology, but I did see um, a lot of cases early in my career, my training, and sometimes for research purposes after that. But it's, this is like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease on the fast track, uh, but affecting uh, um, uh, babies. And so many of them develop this disease in utero and are born uh, already with significant paralysis. Uh, or if they escape that, they develop it uh, within months. And, um, and, and most are dead within a few years. And so uh, uh, here, the results have really been very intriguing because and, and pleasing because it's been treated in two ways. One, using um, uh, CRISPR, using that CRISPR to inject the, a, a proper uh, gene uh, in, into, the, into the motor nerve cells. Um, but anyway, infusing that, those, that, that virus containing the correction and, um, and it's interesting because, again, uh, it's important to get, get to these kids early. But, but even so, in a disease where, where the progression could almost be measured in week by week uh, before death, uh, kids had been treated with one, one form of gene therapy or the other, they actually regain function. I mean, where they were unable to stand, they can stand. Where they were able to stand but not walk, they're walking. Where they couldn't swallow, they're swallowing. Are they getting it all back? No. But clearly the disease has been stopped in its tracks. And what's amazing about it is they actually regain function. Now that would be for adults, with Alzheimer's disease or anything kind of happening to most of the heads I see up there and myself, uh, you probably wouldn't regain function. So at that very young age, the nervous system still has that potential. It's still making cells. It's still making cells in excess of what it's going to need. So maybe that's why some of them appear to regain function. Now, one of the other ways of, of fixing this, other than using CRISPR, is just step more, move down the line. Remember, we started out with, uh, with, a, with the DNA, and then that's transcribed to 
form a kind of a copy, an RNA copy of that. And that RNA copy leaves the, the nucleus and it enters the cytoplasm and it enters a, 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 an organ called the endoplasmic reticulum, which makes protein. So to fix a protein abnormality, you don't necessarily have to fix the DNA. You could just change the messenger. So you could fix the messenger so it's no longer a mutant messenger. So it will actually make the right protein. Or in the case of Honeyman's disease, uh, uh, make an RNA guide to interrupt the messenger RNA so it stops making the abnormal protein that's causing the disease. And there is a clinical, there are, uh, there are clinical trials going on right now using that, that technique in Huntington's disease. And I hope that uh, at least uh, um, uh, using biological markers, you know, whether they're still making the abnormal protein or not in Huntington's disease, it looks as if they're not making the abnormal protein with this uh, RNA infusion. But, um, but whether it actually changes the outcome in the disease, it's too early to tell yet. But it's a, it's a, it shows you where this is going. And then there are a, another group of nasty diseases are these mitochondrial diseases. Remember I mentioned them earlier in the talk? These, uh, we all have uh, in our cell, we have the nucleus and then the cytoplasm and the cytoplasm are all these little membranous uh, balls there that, that make energy high energy phosphate uh, uh, as, as a source of energy. There are only 37 genes, and, uh, but the potential for screw ups with those genes is actually pretty high. And, um, and so how can you fix them? Well, one that was approved, one method that was approved by the House of Lords of the UK uh, two to three years ago, it probably wouldn't be approved shortly south of the border, that was an interesting thing to do. Well, um, why not take the mothers or, or, or um, use a, a normal, let, let, let's say the mother's cells are packed with these abnormal mitochondria. Uh, well, um, why not take the mother's nucleus, which is normal, all of those genes are normal. And then why not find a donor that has normal mitochondria cytoplasm is normal, get rid of the nucleus and put the mother's nucleus in. So you actually have three parents. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it works. It really works. Sounds crazy, but it really works. And for a disease that's really, really nasty, or often really nasty, it, it's quite the fix. And then the genetics of cancer. Well, um, just a few things about that. I mean, Cancers are what I call a, an example of a disease of uh, evolution on the fast track. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the examples of that for me was two years ago at rounds at uh, McMaster, and they had a patient with um, glioblastoma multiforme. That's the worst brain tumor you can get. That's the one that did Ted Kennedy in. And, um, and, um, it uh, and they were doing periodic genomic analysis of this tumor over a period of months. Wow, were those genes changing and, and rapidly? In other words, they were adapting to various chemotherapeutic agents, much the way um, uh, bacteria adapt to different antibiotics. That's, that's pretty quick. You can show that. I mean, maybe the antibiotic kills off 99.9%, .9%, but if 0.01% survive and multiply, they have the means to bypass the antibiotic the same way here with, can, with, with the various cancer chemotherapeutic, uh, cancer chemotherapeutic drugs. So, and the other thing is with that 
tumor, and it's usually a massive tumor, different parts of the tumor are different stages of the disease, which you can't tell from the outside and you can't tell, tell from imaging. Uh, well, where does CRISPR come in to here? Well, one of the ways uh, CRISPR comes in is, well, uh, one, you can uh, use the immune system. Now, you're probably familiar with this because of COVID-19. I mean, you really have two parts to your immune system. Um, you, you have uh, so-called T cells or thylake origin cells uh, that, um, that create uh, antibodies. And, uh, and, uh, and another uh, group of cells that directly attack uh, the, the, uh, the, the cancer cells. So you can edit, you, you can use CRISPR to uh, um, engineer uh, genes that will make certain antibodies that are tailor-made to attack cancer cells specific types of cancer cells. Um, you can imagine that that's an expensive thing. It is. I mean, is that technology available? It is available. We actually talked about this. There was a Nobel Prize uh, given for this uh, three years ago. We talked about that. But the problem is it's very expensive. And it means uh, uh, essentially engineering a treatment that's very specific for one person's cancer at one particular time in the course of the disease. And you may have to change after that. So it's all wonderful technology, but it's very expensive. Now, what about, we get into the really touchy subject now of gene, of, uh, of gene editing for physical traits and cognitive skills. Of course, I've got my two favorite players there that you recognize in tennis. So, but for physical traits um, of strength and speed and, endurance, uh, athleticism. Um, I mean, athletes have been doing that for decades now. Uh, maybe not with gene editing, but uh, using various drugs to kind of spoof themselves up. Um, cognitive skills, it's interesting that I, uh, several years ago, uh, a Beijing group, a large genetic uh, genome sequencing group, was very interested in finding out, okay, if if we uh, look at people who are high achievers in different fields, we're gonna make the, the mental leap to claim, gee, they, they might have a cognitively more advanced brain in some ways uh, to account for those achievements. Are their genomes any different than anyone else? And um, I don't know what the result of this, but, uh, but uh, such a study, I, I must say that some high-end North Americans were involved, or at least were donors to that, that study, but, um, or studies. And um, you know that people sooner or later are gonna try this out. If, it, if you have the money to pay for it, if you have the access to it, if the technology exists, somebody's gonna try this. So some group is gonna try this. And, that, and that's where these, and, uh, I'm just, I've listed about uh, what, three, four, five, six, seven, several of maybe a hundred genetic enhancements that you could use uh, by inserting those genes or activating them. So I won't go through all of those. Uh, well, what are the risks of gene editing? Um, well, um, uh, I, I suppose the most common one is, I mentioned this guide that's maybe uh, 20 to 30 bases in length. So that's an address, 180 Gate Street. But there might be an address that looks just like that or very close to it, maybe just one base is different. And the guide actually goes to that. That's called an off target error or, or, or mistake. The other thing is in the early days, yes, the enzymes kind of cut the, uh, cut, cut, cut the strands, but they left wounds behind. It wasn't repaired properly. And you might've inserted the, the gene in the, uh, a, a proper gene, but you didn't mend the cut ends properly. Well, 
that's where the broad group that I mentioned in Boston, a lot of their, their work uh, incorporates that kind of technology so you can actually bend the two or the cut ends properly. Um, uh, one of the things, and of course, because the technique is so easily done, it invites the creation of novel species that never existed before. Well, that's interesting. And, and um, uh, but if you introduce a new species, we don't know what the result of that might be on the environment. And even introducing artificial bases that don't exist in normally, or weaponizing viruses and, and, uh, and bacteria. Well, I'm gonna just end here because there's a whole lot more that could be said, but I rather like uh, the way Jennifer Duna summarized it. She, she says, it seems undeniable that germline entity, meaning the egg, and or the sperm. Editing in one form or another will, will become reliable enough to perform on humans. I, uh, she says it with a lot more authority than I, but that certainly makes sense. Remember when we did the physics series, we started 1900 to 1930, 30 years. If we were to look at gene editing now, we're still in that first decade or even earlier. This whole field is doing that, huge. So, um, so no wonder they got the Nobel Prize, they deserve it. And, uh, but, uh, but it's very much, uh, uh, we, we don't know what all of the consequences are going to be. And, um, and, and therein lies the risk, if there is, and, and there are risks. But remember that many of these inheritable diseases are nasty diseases. And uh, so even if there are risks, maybe there are risks worth taking. I think they are risks worth taking, but maybe not at the germ cell level where you might affect uh, succeeding generations. So on that note, I'm going to end, but I hope if you have questions, um, you'll get back to me because uh, this, it's, this is the most important thing, I think, I'm biased, I know, but most important thing to happen in science and I'm going to say 10 years, even 20 years because of the potential. Of the, think about it this way. I've, I've said this before, this is upending uh, 4 billion years of natural evolution. We now have it in our power to upend evolution. That's where we are. 